So the book is not really an exhaustive retelling of 18th and 19th century Louisiana. It's the people I ran across in my family who, for one reason or another, really kind of piqued my interest. They, they, they told their stories to me. But it was really, um, how did that come to be? Is I, I had to have a hobby after I quit teaching. <laughs> <laughs> My children are grown. I, you know, I'm not teaching. And so I decided, oh, that's an interesting hobby. Like most people from Louisiana, we want to know about our family stories. So I started digging and then I started wondering about all these names that I was coming across. Who were these people? And, um, you know, some of the names I, I didn't know I was connected to and, and directly descended from. Um, you only hear part of the story, I think. A lot of times things get lost over the generations, and I found that was the case in my family. Um, you know, Ferret is my last name, so obviously I was more attuned to, to that, and not necessarily the Rivier and the Cantrell and the Barrette and the Jones and the Brager. And, um, since there's so many families, I'm going to concentrate on the three guys who are on the cover of the book. Um, and I'll kind of tell you, though, how I got to those three people. As I was deciding to do my genealogy, I thought, where do I even begin? You know, and I thought through my, I, I listened to my family lore throughout the ages, and I knew I was, you know, distantly related to Edgar Degas. And um, so I decided to start Googling around, you know, when did Degas come to New Orleans? And I knew the museum many years ago had done a little um, thing on Degas in New Orleans. So I ran across this book by Chris Benfey. I don't know if any of you have ever read this book, but um, so I started reading and all the names of my family were in this book. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, I've got a great start. So I started really digging. Um, and Chris was very, very nice and um, corresponded with me um, and shared his some of his information with me. And so that's really where I have Chris Benfey to thank for really um, starting me on this journey. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where this is from. Here, here I am right here. Um, and here is the first guy on the cover, Vincent Rillier. And, um, and here over here, he was Edgar Degas' grandfather. He is also my direct grandfather five times back. So we're in the, you know, he's in my family history. So um, we're also, all right, so then what did I do? How did I decide how to approach this? I had names, but I didn't have much more than that. I wanted to add flesh to their bones. So I started asking myself some questions. Um, like, how did time, place, and culture and events come together to shape who they were? Because it, because it mattered when they were born, in what circumstances they were born, what events were going on around them. So obviously I had a lot of digging to do. Having been a history teacher, I, I was thrilled to do that. So that was one of the things I started having to see what, what was life really like? What was, what was going on here? Um, and then I wanted to know how did the choices my ancestors made affect Louisiana, because we all, even in a small way, affect where we're living and how we're living in the community in which we live. So those two questions sort of guided me as I kind of made this trek through history and my family. Um, and this is something I kind of grappled with and I think everybody does. Um, so as we, as we evolve as humans, it's natural that our sense of justice is offended by practices of the past. I mean, we can't avoid slavery, 
the lack of agency for women and shifting loyalties. Because after all, Louisiana was a, under many, many different flags and the people living there didn't really have a choice as to who was governing them. Um, so I, I tried not to populate this with archetypes, you know, the evil slave holder, the noble enslaved person, the sexist father, um, you know, or the heroic, you know, mixed race man. Um, I didn't want their lives to be reduced to myth. I wanted to know the whole person. Um, and as we all know, human beings are full of contradictions. And, and this is something I really truly believe um, is that when we look at history, we have to really understand that it's not a series of unrelated facts, but it's a synergy. It's a coming together of complex stories, interweaving and meandering. And they are within a particular time and place. And we always have to remember that and that, and that is how how they made their choices and how they lived their lives. So I'm gonna start with Vincent Rieur. He was born in 1740, so way back. I am actually an eighth, possibly more than that, generation Louisianian. Um, and he, his parents came from France um, and he settled, they settled near Bayou Bonfuca near Slidell, and he was also in the Pascagoula area early, early on. Um, and only five non-native families lived there. Can you imagine coming to a place where only five families were? You've got all these young children, your wife. I mean, this was these were families. This was not just, you know, pioneers or soldiers. Um, and the Biloxi Indians were there at the time. And so those five families looked to the Biloxi Indians for, how, you know, how do, how do you survive in this area? You know, how do you um, use the natural resources? And the Biloxi Indians bred cattle. So that is one of the things the Rayers learned to do from the Biloxi Indians. And meat was very, very rare then. And so they would actually, the Rieus knew that, okay, this is an opportunity for us to get in on this market. And so they would raise cattle and send the meat to New Orleans. Um, I'd always heard stories that Vincent Rio was this, you know, um, revolutionary war hero. And, but I didn't really know the whole story um, until I kind of started to dig into it. Um, if you could see, let's see. No, I didn't. Um, at this time in history, Louisiana was under the Spanish flag. Um, and Bernardo de Galvez was the governor. And there was a, there were, pretty contentious relationship between the British and the Spanish at this time. As you can see, this, here we are in West Florida, and that would have been the Bayou Bonfuca property of Vincent Rio would have been in British territory. He also had property in New Orleans which would have been in Spanish territory. So he had some choices to make. Am I gonna be loyal to the Spanish crown or the British crown? What, what am I gonna do here? Um, so eventually he makes his choice on the side of the Spanish um, and he actually becomes a leader in the militia. Um, so, Galvez made it known that we were not going to mess around with the British anymore. We're, we were calling them on all of their little tricks. They were trying to get into the Mississippi River. So Galvez sends out all these, sh these ships and patrols to patrol. And Vincent Rieur was patrolling up and down the Amy River and um, in, in Bayou Manchac. 
and which was the shortcut from the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. So clearly very, very strategic. Um, so Rio had these 14 citizen soldiers on his little sloop of war and they're cruising around and they get word and they get intelligence that there's a heavily armed ship, British ship that wants to come in to buy you Manchac. Well, with these 14 citizen soldiers, he develops a plan. They hide out until they see the ship. Then they, at one time, make all kinds of noise and fire on the ship all at the same time. And the, the people on the ship, the crew, thinks they're being attacked by this huge force. Well, they're not really, but they go below deck. So Rear instructs his men to batten down the hatches. I mean, he, they go and lock them in the ship and capture everybody on board. So the Madrid Gazette goes wild. They praise him as a war hero. And the rest is, as they say, history. <laughs> so I got the, the whole story. So, um, you know, it, it shows me that he, he had some ingenuity and some leadership ability. And so I, I'm kind of getting to know him, even though it was so, so, so many years ago, um, 1778, I believe. Um, so Vincent's mother, and, and unfortunately, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. I don't tell a lot about my female ancestors and most of the time their stories are told through their husbands or their sons because there are not a lot of primary resources and things that kind of flesh out their lives. Um, so as I find little snippets, um, I sort of put them in because I think it's important because they were very important to what was going on as well. Um, so Vincent's mother was quite an interesting um, businesswoman. Vincent's father died um, in 1760, and she took it upon herself to buy an extremely large tract of land, this entire area. Does anybody recognize this area? This is almost all of East St. Tammany, and it's where the city of Slidell is today. Um, and she purchased this huge tract of land from the Biloxi Indians and developed her cattle and tar and pitch and business there. And uh, Vincent eventually took that over. Well, the family didn't hold on to the land, obviously. <laughs> um, there was a Supreme Court case over the ownership of the land because as what often happens, as the regimes changed, as it went from Spain to France or France to Spain or England, or you had to then apply for a land grant and get it approved by that new government. Well, that was not done properly according to this case. And so eventually the heirs of Vincent Rio lost the land. Um, Vincent Rear was also very, very important in the, what we know is the French Quarter today. Um, before two devastating fires in the court, in the, what we know is the French Quarter today, there was a fire in, um, 1788 and 1794, and they were, they were pretty devastating to the city. Um, this one was on Good Friday in 1788, and it covered this extremely large area of the city. Almost most of it was burned. Um, and then again in 1794, um, not as much of the city was burned, but again, a pretty large area. So Vincent Briere, had his businesses and his homes, as most people do, even though he had the big, huge tract of land in East St. Tammany Parish, um, 
in St. Tammany. He also, of course, had homes in New Orleans. So these and warehouses and all kinds of things. Um, so he set about rebuilding. And this is a shot of what the city might have looked like before the fires. Very French architecture, wooden, um, very, very different from what the city looks like now. And you have to understand this is under the Spanish Empire, so you're going to have a Spanish influence. And this is one of the homes Vincent built. Um, Bethlehem Lafon was the architect, and some of you have probably run across some of that in your research. Um, He's a pretty famous architect, and I've recently found out he was also a pirate. Um, I'm going to have to dig into that a little bit. Um, you might recognize this also. This is at one time um, a branch of the United States Bank after Rio's death, and it was sold um, to several other owners. Um, it was also Waldorn and Adler. Waldorn Antiques before that. Um, and now it's just an art, it's an art gallery. So um, after, um, and interestingly enough in my research, and I don't know if any of you run across this kind of weird stuff, but um, my great uncle was an architect, Douglas Ferret, and he did the renovation on this property for the Adlers. So I, I found that very fascinating and weird. <laughs> um, he also built this property, which you might recognize as Brennan's, that it, um, most people believe this was one of his major um, like storage areas, but a little nicer than that. But, um, and, the reason everything looks so different is because the Spanish government finally said, okay, this fire stuff is getting out of control. We need to have some building regulations. And so not only were the, did the style change, it, the outside changed and the materials changed. It could still be made, homes could still be made and structures could still be made of wood, but they had to be covered in cement so that um, fire would obviously not take over. Um, now, Vincent died in 1800, and um, his wife, Marie Antoinette Tronquette Rieu, the widow Rieu, purchased a large piece of land on Bayou St. John with, um, it already had a home on it, and some of you might recognize this as Peacock House. Um, it's on Bayou St. John, and she made significant changes to the house um, and then eventually sold the home to James Petot, who was the first elected mayor of New Orleans. So and she was quite a formidable businesswoman. She kept all the books for the Bayou Bunfoca plantation. She owned lots and lots and lots of property in the French Quarter. Here's some of her French Quarter property. If you can see, um, it spans from Toulouse to Charters to Royal, and on this side is St. Louis. And all of this, I don't know if you can see the shaded part, it's a little bit light, but all of that shading was her property. So a lot of what you know in that area, Royal Orleans Hotel, all of that area was hers. Um, and there is Vincent in his military uniform, um, in his Spanish militia, militia uniform. Um, there was an exhibit at the Ogden Museum of Art in 2018, um, and it was um, on the about the artist Salazar, who was a Spanish colonial artist, one of the few in North America, and he painted many, many paintings in New Orleans. And Vincent Rio's paint portrait was one of those. And here I am with it and my two daughters. So here we are many, many generations down and, and we've got 
um, the portrait. So that was sort of exciting. And I was kind of instrumental in bringing that portrait to light in, in the scholar who was studying Salazar for the exhibit. So that was very exciting. Um, the next, I'm, I'm going kind of quickly because I have a lot to say, but I don't want to <laughs> stop me if I'm going too fast. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Norbert Rieger, but he should be one of the most famous Louisiana sons that we have, but he's sort of been forgotten. I mean, every now and then you get him on a list, but you don't really know much about him. Um, he is a free man of color. He was the, the son of Vincent Ria Jr. His mother was Constance Vivon, and she was a free man, woman of color. Her mother had at one time been a slave and um, was free, but she, his mother had never been enslaved. And um, Vincent Rieux and Constance Vivant have often been described as um, a plissage, which would have been a contract. And it was sort of a mythological thing that um, a wealthy, usually French or Creole man, white man, would have a mistress. Well, that's all kind of been debunked. Um, in, in doing my research and speaking to many professors, um, Emily Clark, namely at Tulane, who is a um, professor of colonial American history, um, she said, it's really a myth. There is some truth to it, but it mainly applied to the women who came as refugees from Saint-Domingue. Um, the women like Constance Vivant, who had very wealthy white fathers, um, would have had a much higher social standing and, and really would have been accepted into Creole society. Um, Norbert's parents lived together as husband and wife for many, many years until he died at the age of 50, and they had seven children together. And they presented themselves as married, although the law did not allow them to marry at that time in history. So um, that was sort of a surprise to me. I didn't know. And Chris Bemphy described him as a closely guarded secret in my family. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd never, not, you know, I hadn't heard of him. But I don't know that he was a secret. Um, things changed so much. The lines of race were so blurred in the early 19th century New Orleans that, um, and it was clear to me that he that they all had very close ties and relationships in business and socially. So I'm not sure. I think, um, so you can see where he comes in. Here's Vincent Rio that I was telling you about the war hero. And here's his son, Vincent, and, and here are Norbert and Edmund. Okay. Now, all of these products owe something to Norbert Rieu, and I'm going to explain how. Um, so glue, sugar, recycling on the International Space Station, salt, fresh water, pharmaceuticals, soap, and evaporated milk. So all of those things could not exist or may not have existed yet if it had not been for Norbert every year. Um, he was pretty much a child prodigy. Many, many, many um, young boys and young men from New Orleans went to Paris to study, but um, he went to Paris at age 11. He was considered a prodigy, a genius. Um, his father was an inventor and an entrepreneur and a cotton press owner. Um, 
So his father had a business colleague in Paris who kind of who was also an inventor, who took Norbert under his wing and watched out for him and made introductions to him at the very prestigious L'Ecole Centrale. So he, he had to be admitted to that, and, and, and he was. And this is what 19th century Paris might have looked like when Norbert arrived. Now, can you imagine sending your 11-year-old son off before steamboats even on this treacherous, perilous journey across the Atlantic Ocean. I cannot, but they knew that it was important for him to be educated in Paris. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of zip through this because I don't wanna spend too much time, but I, at the same time, I don't wanna miss this stuff. Um, so he arrives in Paris in 1817 at age 11. Okay, by 1826, he's got his first patent. Um, and it had to do with compressed hydrogen gas used to power steam engines. And lots and lots of people think that it was actually a forerunner to the compound steam engine. Um, and it was written about in journals, in you know industrial journals. Um, so that was kind of a big deal. He created quite a big stir and worked on that for quite some time. And then in 1830, he's still there. He's very young, he's 24 years old. Um, he starts writing and publishing his theory of multiple effect evaporation. He was very, very interested in steam and the new field of thermodynamics. So um, he, he created an, an enormous stir in the scientific community um, back then. Um, so it, his revolutionary spirit also applied to politics. He was um, part of a secret society that developed after the J July Revolution um, that ousted Charles X in Paris. And he was part of the publications committee that really wanted some really Republican ideas to come across rather than um, the monarchy. So he ends up getting arrested, but leaves Paris before his trial and comes back to Louisiana. Um, so he's back in Louisiana um, and he needs to get financial backing for his invention that he wants to put out there. He wants to use multiple effect evaporation to revolutionize the sugar industry. Okay, so um, in, he starts looking for investors and it's still really hard. His ideas are so revolutionary, people don't even understand what he's talking about. So it, it's, it, he has to work really, really hard at getting investors. Um, unfortunately, in, shortly after he returned from Paris, his, his father passed away. And um, his father was very wealthy, but unfortunately he did not inherit anything. Neither did his siblings because of laws that had been passed um, in the 18th, early 1830s saying that children of mixed race could not be legitimate and so could not inherit. So his cousins and his father's siblings inherited all of his father's money. Um, another thing that happened to Norbert um, shortly after that is he knew that drainage was very, very important to the city of New Orleans. He developed a drainage plan for the city, drew it up as a civil engineer, presented it, had backers, um, and an enemy of his father, Edmund Forstall, pretty much shut him out, took the plans and um, gave it to somebody else and did not give Norbert credit for the work. Oddly enough, his cousin, his first cousin, 
James Barrett was on the board of the new drainage um, company. So it, it, it gets a little messy. Um, so before Rio's process was around, there was what was called the Jamaica train process of refining sugar. Um, and there's a picture of it right there. It was, boiled, you've seen the large sugar kettles. What was boiled, the cane juice was boiled in these huge kettles. And it was very, very labor intensive, very dangerous. Um, many of the enslaved people were severely burned. Um, and it required vast, vast amounts of fuel. So it was very, very expensive as well. And it took great skill and meticulous timing to know exactly when to cool the sugar so it would crystallize. So you're talking about a very unpredictable, inexact sort of thing. <clears throat> well, his invention did end up revolutionizing the sugar industry in Louisiana. Um, and in the Caribbean, really, because his, his um, equipment ended up being used in Cuba and all over the Caribbean. Um, so um, I think one of the things that I didn't realize is that, that his, whole, his whole theory became the basis for all of modern industrial evaporation. Um, and, and one of the quotes from Charles Brown, a sugar chemist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it says, and I have to read this, and I don't like to read to y'all too much from the presentation, but I've always held that Rio's invention is the greatest in the history of American chemical engineering, and I know of no other invention that has brought so great a savings to all branches of chemical engineering. That's pretty serious, and I regret that I didn't know who he was before now. And I'm kind of on a mission to get people to know who he is. Um, so Ria starts trying to get investors, okay? Tell me about that. Okay, so he tries to get investors and that doesn't come off too well. And um, he finally ditches the Creoles, okay? He says, you know, I can't, I can't deal with you people. One tried to steal my stuff. One tried to, you know, he, he, he's done with them. So he approaches Theo Packwood and Packwood is an, you know, a, an American um, from the East Coast and he starts backing him and is thrilled with the product and starts endorsing him and publishes a, a, a rave review in the Picayune. Judah Benjamin was Packwood's partner. Some of you might know that Judah Benjamin was also a cabinet member in the Confederacy. He was also a Jew and a, Louis and a senator from Louisiana. And that is his bell chase plantation that he owned. Um, and Rio would stay with him for weeks and weeks at a time at bell chase and hold kind of impromptu seminars on sugar production. And um, so, um, and here's a picture of Rear's patent that he finally received in 19, excuse me, in 1843. Um, and his process was eventually stolen in Europe and wasn't put together well. They didn't really understand it and they marketed it as their own and sold it as multiple effect evaporation. And so his process got a really bad rap undeservedly because it wasn't done correctly. And it, he was just utterly heartbroken over that. Um, and a whole big controversy went in the papers in the Picayune and Rio chimed in even from Paris. So Duncan Kenner was head of the Sugar Planners Association and finally had a committee to settle that this was really Rio's process and we should celebrate him as an inventor. Um, and we should have, you know, and the Picayune finally says, yes, we should erect monuments to him. 
Um, he eventually had to leave Louisiana because of restrictive laws and, and things that were happening um, in Louisiana at the time. He ended up moving to New York and married a young white widow who was from New Orleans. Um, and then she died shortly after that. He had many racial hurdles to, to cross, even though he moved to New York and moved out of the South. When he went to get his patent renewed in 1857, he was told, you're not a citizen, you're a slave. Well, he was never a slave, but the Dred Scott decision had just come down. And so, you know, all that was a little bit murky and race was never asked on the patent application, but I'm sure that that played a role in them thinking he was a slave. And they probably meant that you're not a citizen because you're not white. Um, so he ends up trying to get a passport in 1862. Mm -hmm. And I think he probably passed for white because mixed race people could not get passports. That would mean the United States government would recognize them as citizens. So he got a passport. He was also a noted Egyptologist of the time and translated the book of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, and eventually he married another white woman in um, England, which I think he was probably with when he left New York. Um, and named Emily Cacao. She was a um, she was from England. And here I am, actually, at his grave in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. And the next person, and he sh he's a little bit shorter. I, you can, look, there's loads more about Norbert in this book. <laughs> I, I cut him short, but I cut, I'm cutting everybody short. But here's William Barrett. And um, let's see. He was the mayor of New Orleans in the mid 1800s. And again, as part of that exhibit that I was telling you about, this is his mother, Vincent Rio's daughter, Eugenie. And here's her dress. It's not the exact same dress, but it is one of her dresses, and it was part of the exhibit. And here I am back behind the scenes at the Louisiana State Museum, looking at my grandmother's dress before it was restored. So it was very exciting. And that is not William, that is his older brother, James. Um, and the boy, he had two older brothers, James and John, and a younger sister, Eugenie. Um, and the boys went to the College of Orleans when they were young, and it was on the corner of Hospital, which is now Governor Nichols, and St. Claude in the old mansion house of the Treme Plantation. Um, and they boarded at the school, as most of the wealthy children did. Um, some of the poor kids were day, day students. Um, and they studied Greek and Latin and Spanish and math and history and all the rest. But it was all in French. It was all taught in French. Um, in 1880, the marriage's daughter, Fanny. And George moved to the United States and was the British consul at New Orleans. Um, there's the Ferret Brother Cotton Press. The Ferret Brothers, when they returned, went into the cotton business. And they um, their press was in Faubourg St. Mary. And it was on St. Charles between Perdido and um, Poitras and extended back to Barone. So it was quite large. Um, and they were kind of known as industrial pioneers. Um, William Ferret also invested with his brother James and several other businessmen in 
the Merchant Exchange. Um, it was a hotel, but it was more than a hotel. Um, they were really popular. Exchanges were very popular in port cities. Um, and they were kind of hotel, but also um, banking and, and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes trading. And also a lot of the local power brokers kind of hung out there and made deals and met people. And th there's a legend that the cocktail was invented at the Merchants Exchange in the bar there. I don't know how true that is, but it's been repeated many times in lots of things I've read. Um, William Ferret was a Whig, um, which was a party that formed in the 1830s in opposition to Jackson, uh, the Jacksonian politics. Um, and uh, Henry Clay was one of its leaders, and William and Henry Clay were very, very close friends. And um, William was a, a big supporter of Henry Clay. Um, he was William went on to be elected to the city of New Orleans, mayor of the city of New Orleans in 1840, and he ran under the banner of what was called the Native American Party. And it was a splinter party of the Whigs, and it was sort of a fringe thing. Um, it was in reaction to the large influx of immigrants in the 1830s. And basically what they wanted to do was um, restore the Alien and Sedition Acts and change the naturalization laws. Um, you can imagine that went over very well with the Creole population, right? <laughs> um, under Ferrat, the New Orleans public schools were established, um, and he and some other prominent businessmen um, pretty much handed this to Governor Roman and said, this is what we want, um, and pushed it through. Um, and every white child was um, eligible to attend. Um, Ferrat ran again in 1842, but he was beaten by Denis Perrier because of what I just told you, um, that naturalization stuff did not go over well with the Creoles, and they pretty much kicked him out of office, and the Whigs sort of shied away from him because it was kind of a dicey issue. Well, that didn't last long. Um, Career only stayed in office for nine months. He went on to be a, a state, have a statewide office. So Ferret runs again. Well, this time the Whigs said, okay, okay, we need somebody in office. We got to get behind this guy. So they coalesced around him. He ran as a Whig, not as the Native American party and won a gigantic margin, won by a gigantic margin. I think he beat Genoa. Um, after, after his terms as mayor, he was named Colestro collector of customs, okay, for the District of Mississippi in the state of Louisiana. So everything that was coming and going in the Mississippi River and the waters around there. Um, and he had to protect against smuggling and comings and goings of ships. Well, there was a big scandal during his time as collector of customs. At that time, there was a big push to annex Cuba. And it, it eventually was a push in the United States. And then, you know, it, it, it kind of morphed into a Southern cause. And the Southern cause, it was a Southern cause because they figured Cuba would come in as a slave state and increase their numbers. So there were filibuster expeditions that came out of New Orleans and filibusters were soldiers of fortune. This was strictly prohibited by the United States government. It was not legal, but it happened. And one such filibuster led by Narcisco Lopez, a Venezuelan born soldier of fortune who lived in Cuba at one time, um, got a bunch of forces, raised a bunch of money in New Orleans and under William Perret's watch, his ship, the Pampero, left the port of New Orleans. Well, it created, and they ended up in Cuba. It was a disaster. Uh, many, many of them that were killed, 
wounded, arrested, sent back, sent to Spain. It was a total disaster. Well, the people in New Orleans went crazy, sacked the Cuban consulate, and it was a big international incident. It was an embarrassment for the United States, even though they didn't sanction it, it wasn't part of that. So they had to make reparations and they had to kind of fix it with the Spanish government. And so one of the people who pretty much took the fall was William Ferret. Now the national newspapers thought he was complicit and the local newspapers of course reported that he was not. So I'll leave it up to you. He actually published his own version and his correspondence with the United States government as to what was going on at the time. So you can actually go back and I have read and um, he was the only one in town. All the other officials were away for the summer because this happened in August and most people were away for the summer in August in New Orleans. So as time moves on, he goes back and he runs his cotton press for a while and he's very sick. Um, all right, so we're coming toward the Civil War. 1862, the, um, the Union Navy's bearing down on New Orleans and martial law is declared and William was tapped as one of the provost marshals. That didn't last long, unfortunately, because he was very, very ill with, heart, with a heart condition. Um, so shortly after that, New Orleans surrendered to the Union forces. Um, and two emissaries were sent off of the ships to walk to City Hall and take control of the city. Or, you know, well, there was a mob following them. There was sure to be bloodshed. It was going to get ugly. And William Ferret and L.H. Forstall convinced the, the crowd to stand down. They knew there was only bad things were going to come. They were not going to win this fight. Okay, they were not going to defeat the Union Navy that was there with 13 ships. Um, so uh, he finally escorted the two emissaries to City Hall and got the crowd to kind of calm down a little bit. Um, and as it, Benjamin Butler had his troops um, housed at Barrett's Cotton Press and his property was taken and eventually returned after his death to his son, William. And that's it. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions. If uh, anyone would like to ask a question for Michelle and also, um, are there Zoom questions? If you're on Zoom and you'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and um, and you, you can raise your hand on the screen. I'll stop the screen share so we can see you. Uh, or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. I think we have one from Catherine on Zoom. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, Catherine. And... Hi, I was just saying thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for listening. How long did it take you to do the research? Starts and stops and starts and stops. Five years. Yeah. It's there for the primary. You know, this is going to sound crazy, but um, a lot of it was Tulane, um, historic New Orleans collection, but Google Books has opened the world up. I mean, you can read primary documents from anywhere and Google Translate. I mean, I read 19th century French reports and newspapers using Google Translate and Google Books so I could access them from my desk at home. Um, and it was, that was truly amazing to me. You never know what you're gonna find when you Google somebody's name. <laughs> what about the state? Really how 
I did. The Louisiana State Museum, and I did. Um, but I will tell you, um, Tulane is pretty uh, um, amazing. And one of my mentors, and I, who I met through a friend who encouraged me throughout this entire process, um, was Lawrence Powell. Um, Larry Powell is a professor emeritus of history, and he, um, and you'll, if you get the book, you'll see that he um, really, really opened some doors for me because scholars would, um, and he allowed me to use his name, and, and scholars would answer my questions, like Emily Clark and people that I, that, you know, and Larry kind of guided me, shake that tree a little more, you know. Um, he really encouraged me. Um, there are many, many more stories in here um, of lots of different people. I just, um, and Norbert's brother, Edmund, was very, very fascinating, totally opposite. He was more, he was the one who fought for universal suffrage um, and started, was one of the founding um, members of the Republican Party in Louisiana. Oh, they're actually thrilled. One, one of my aunts, who is 90, she goes, you're telling the family secrets? <laughs> I said, not really. <laughs> I said, it's pretty public knowledge. I'm just sharing them. Okay. Uh, we have someone on Zoom who just wanted to know the name of the book. And, uh... Oh, sure. <clears throat> and it's available on Amazon. And I have some here tonight, if anybody wants. Um, it's called My Family, A Window into the Secret Successes and Sins of Early New Orleans and Beyond. And if you just put my name into Amazon, you can, um, Michelle Ferret Prather, you, it'll come up. Um, it's Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, um, local bookstores. So if, if you're interested. Um, any other questions? Yes. Just another one. When you, one of the first things you said was in the colonial area, there were only five families. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Bradley and I'm Grapevine, and that's one of the mm -hmm. five families. And I just didn't know if you were talking about by Bantuka area or. More the Pascagoula area. Okay. That's where. Yeah, before he. Yeah. Before they came over to a little bit west into the Slidell area. Yes. So he would have been there with your ancestors. Yeah. Very interesting. Anybody else? Any other questions? So you mentioned at the beginning that finding information on your female ancestors was very difficult. Could you, could you tell us what you ran into and was there, did you have a good find on any of them that was interesting? You know, um, the Collins de Ball, um, records, um, property records, the historic New Orleans collection, that was where I found a treasure trove of information on my female um, ancestors because women could own property under the Spanish and the French. And I, I would just Google their names in there. And that's how I found out how much property they owned in their own names not in their husband's names or, um, and so I kind of got a window into that and then it, it got me to dig into their wills and you could see what they had and what they left. And, you know, I found out that uh, Marie Antoinette Rea had uh, a stash of gold in her house and all the records for her plantation and that she was the one overseeing all of that. So I think, women have been given a one-dimensional, they've been presented in a very one-dimensional way. Like um, Norbert's mother, I found out that she owned half a plantation with her husband, for lack of a better word, business partner. Um, and she was, and this is, this is a dicey thing that people don't talk about and I'd like to start talking about is that she was a free woman of color, yet she owned 40 slaves. So I think it's something, it's an opening for a conversation um, about women and about free people of color 
and how that all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did Norbert Bridges' mother write a will? Yes. That, if you had children that were not legitimate, that could only inherit if you wrote a will. She had money in her own right from her father. She still had to write a will so her children could properly inherit. She did, well, yes, she did. And she actually ended up leaving most of her assets to her daughter who was not married. Did not leave it to the boys. So I found kind of interesting. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Anybody else? Else Anybody Zoom? else on Zoom? I don't see any hands raised. Do you? Okay. Well, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.